This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Are you driving your car or doing laundry right now? Podcasts go best when they're bundled with another activity, like Progressive Home and Auto Policies. They're best when bundled, too. Having these two policies together makes insurance easier and could help you save. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. Quote a home and car bundle today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Welcome to Mom and Daughter Fighting Sleep's parenting podcast for Monday, April 17th, the Pet Problems Edition. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 11, Oliver, who's eight, and Teddy, who's six. We live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm Jamila Mew. I'm a writer, contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column, and mom to Naima, who's 10, and we live in Los Angeles. I'm Zach Rosen. I host another show. It's called The Best Advice Show, and I'm dad to Noah, who's five, and Ami, who's two. We live in Detroit, Michigan. Well, it's Pet Week here at Slate, and we have a question about one of the most difficult parts of being a pet and human parent, dealing with a sick pet. We'll, of course, also have recommendations and dive into our mailbag. Let's start today with our listener question. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm the single mom of two lovely girls who are aged 11 and 13. I've owned dogs my entire adult life, and about two years ago, I decided it was time to get a puppy. They have been very involved in his care and training since we got him, so they're really bonded to him. Unfortunately, this puppy, who's now almost two, has had chronic health issues that are progressive. We're struggling to even get him stable at this point. His chronic health issues have taken a toll on my ability to do my job, be an engaged parent, and be a good human. My mental health and confidence have taken a huge hit, and so has my checkbook. Recently, a downturn in his health included an $8,000 emergency surgery bill, and he's still struggling. I've decided he needs to be rehomed, and I don't know how to talk about this with my children. I have mentioned in the past that we're doing the best we can for him, but there might come a time where we can't take care of him anymore. Now that time has arrived, and I have no idea how to address it with my children, there's also a chance that I'm unable to find another home for him and he'll need to be euthanized. I know it's going to be really hard on all of us, but I don't want them to blame me or for our relationship to suffer because they feel like I gave up on him. I want them to understand that I'm doing this so he can be taken care of by people that have more time to deal with his illness and so I can be a better parent and human. Thank you for all the thoughts and advice. Signed, my dog has a stomach ache. This is so sad. I'm so sorry that your dog is sick and that you are overwhelmed. And um, this is just a, a, such a tough situation. $8,000 in emergency surgery. Oh, man. Um, we have a dog, too. And uh, I'm a big dog lover. And, and I really feel you. You're in between a rock and a hard place. And your girls, 11 and 13, are old enough to go through this with you. They don't have to lead the process, but there is no reason why they shouldn't be brought into the conversation around what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. They don't need to have the final say, nor should they. This has to be your call. Um, But whether you have to find another home for the dog or euthanize the dog, regardless, this is one of those really critical, challenging, heartbreaking milestones that they're going to go through in their life. And we need practice suffering. We need practice with loss. We need practice with sickness because there's just more to come. And so I think the more open you are with how you're navigating this and how you're feeling about it, the ch- the and, and the financial piece should also be, you, you should be open about that. I think our kids need to know that, you know, the the stuff in our lives and their lives has a cost and we work really hard and, you know, we can't always afford it. You've also, you also warned them early on that, that you might have to, to find another home for the dog. And if it does come to, to euthanasia, there are uh, amazing at home 
uh, services mm -hmm. that you can that you can bring in. In fact, I just interviewed someone on on the Best Advice Show. I haven't run that interview yet, but but she um, lost her dog, and what she taught me, in addition to the end of life pet care that is available for you, there's also like some control that you can exert over the situation. If it again, if it does come to euthanasia, like between now and the time you put that dog down, you, the three of you can like go and do to the best of the dog's ability, the dog's favorite things. You can feed the dog its favorite food. You can take them to their favorite park. You can cuddle them and really just like know that the, I mean, frankly, the end of your time with a dog is near regardless. Think about what your, your dog's favorite things are and like, make the your last days with them as as sweet and as joyful and as cuddly um as you possibly can and then once the dog is out of your house grieve together and be open with uh how sad you are because there's no there's no getting around it yeah um i mean i'm really co-signing everything that zach had to say your girls are old enough to be a part of this process with you so you shouldn't have to shoulder it all alone and you know they need to understand that loss is a constant part of life animals get sick people get sick people pass away animals pass away this is just something that they'll have to deal with and you know, doing your best to surround them with love, to surround the dog with love in these final moments that you all have together, trying your best to comfort these girls and letting them know that you've done all you can do and that you are operating in the dog's best interest as well. I agree with all that. I, you know, I love to think about why a letter writer wrote in to us and I mm. read between the lines yep. in this letter that they're not sure it's the right choice. Mm. Like that they feel that some guilt that they have this dog and the dog is sick and they are doing things for the dog, but that it's too much. And so I'm wondering if you guys have advice. Because I think if you feel like you can't take care of the dog and you just cannot pour into it the way it needs to be finding someone that can is the right thing to do. Right. But I think that there's a lot of guilt or wondering like, am I giving up on something when I get a pet? Do I just kind of get them with whatever, you know, troubles they have and it's mine to deal with? Like, do you have advice for that? I don't, we are not, we have a fish and a snail and the snail dies a lot and we just replace the snail. Yeah. So I'm not sure I'm the best person to <laughs> to address this, but I do, I just fundamentally read this letter as I'm having trouble addressing this with my older children because I fundamentally don't know that I'm doing the right thing. You know, you have the resources that you have, you know, most families would not have $8,000 on hand for emergency surgery. So I can imagine that you weren't expecting to have something, you know, cost that much money. And this dog is requiring more of you than you're able to give. You know, the humane thing to do is to try to find people who are able to provide him the care that he needs as opposed to just simply keeping him, you know, and denying him treatment. There are amazing uh, foster dog parents and 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 people who who love taking on sick dogs. Like it's a friend of mine. Like that's one of her projects in life is to like care for dogs that um, are otherwise uh, you know unable to to live in other homes. And so yeah, I mean, I think you're going to do your due diligence to find another home for the dog. And if it, it sounds like he's a great guy. Um, despite the medical issues, which, you know, like Jamila was saying, you, you can do what you can do, but another family just might have more financial capacity to, to shoulder that burden. But like, you should not go bankrupt taking care of this dog. It's heartbreaking, but you can't do that. And you know that. Yeah. And I think we all agree that you can explain that to the kids too. Mm -hmm. And I think even explaining to them that you, like, that you're conflicted about it, too. You know, that you wish yep. that that wasn't the way it was. I just think these kids are, they're old enough. I know mm -hmm. when I first read the question, I was, like, looking, I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of great, like, picture books <laughs> about this. And I'm like, oh, the children are, the children are older. Um, and also just consulting with palliative pet care. 
um, Google it. There's going oh, to be one idea. in your town, and they will help you move through the decision also um, before having to, you don't have to um, like retain them or anything. You can just call and kind of have a consultation. And that will be helpful too, because they've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. Like imagine having that perspective. Well, I think regardless of what happens, it's a really difficult decision. And we're, yeah. we're sorry that you have to make this and your kids um, have to go through this as well. So my dog has a stomach ache. We will, of course, be thinking of you. And we mm-hmm. would love to hear an update on, on how things go and what you decide to do and how the kids did. Everyone else, if you have some tried and true advice, it sounds like this letter writer could use it. So send in your stories. You can email us at momanddad at slate.com or send us a voicemail at 646-357-9318. All right, we're going to take a quick break and we will see you back here in a second. You may know Kelly Ripa from hosting the Live with Kelly and Ryan show for the last 20 years. Now you can get to know her in a whole new way by listening to her podcast, Let's Talk Off Camera with Kelly Ripa. This weekly podcast will transport you inside the unfiltered mind of Kelly Ripa. In each episode, Ripa will dive deep into her life and candidly discuss her marriage, motherhood, career, and how she manages to juggle it all in the public eye. Kelly will talk about everything she could never say on camera. It will be unfiltered and deep, but most of all fun. Joined by a rotating group of friends like Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson, Kelly dives deep into a wide range of topics. They'll talk about everything from crazy fitness trends to sex tips, all with humor, heart, and tenacity. So whether you're a longtime Kelly fan or just looking for a great new show, this podcast is perfect for you. Listen to Let's Talk Off Camera with Kelly Ripa every Wednesday on Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. Sax.com editors are always tracking the top styles that are trending right now. Tailored blazers and midi dresses are selling out at Saks.com, especially from brands like Veronica Beard and The Row. And Saks.com editors are seeing Loewe's oversized tote on the streets of New York, Milan, and Paris. If you want your own free personalized trend recommendations, Saks.com stylists can do that and more. Plus, there's free shipping and returns all the time at Saks.com. Smoothie King asks, what's that sound? <gasps> That's the sound of hearts popping out of your eyes when you see Smoothie King's all-new Smoothie Bowls. These power pack beauties are just waiting to be spooned. Our Smoothie Bowls start with acai or pitaya and are handcrafted with fresh toppings like sliced bananas, sweet berries, ripe mangoes, crunchy purely Elizabeth granola, and a savory peanut butter drizzle. Mmm, that's the sound of a Smoothie Bowl being made fresh just for you. The new Smoothie Bowls menu, only at Smoothie King. All right, let's move on to recommendations. Zach, what are you recommending this week? So this week I'm going to to recommend this harkens back to my my fail story from this past Thursday um, in which Ami threw up a ton over the course of one evening last week. And a recommendation is up until that point, we would have a plastic bag if he was sleeping with us to try to catch his puke. Um, I happen to have an aluminum chafing dish in the room uh, to catch the water that was coming out of my baseboard during the winter. And I found that, you know, the chafing dish, it's like, uh, it's kind of soft. So you can kind of like bend it to where you're kind of like putting it right under his mouth, kind of like a a bedpan, but in front of his mouth. This is disgusting. But honestly, (laughs) I think this is helpful because he was throwing up so frequently um, yeah. like we would hear it coming and then I would just grab the dish with, with one, with one hand and just, um, hold it under his mouth, which you can't do with a plastic bag. You need two hands with Correct. a plastic bag. Yeah, so the chafing dish enables you to have one free hand to do whatever you have to do, you know, rub his, rub his back, rub his head, you know, throw the pillow that he just puked on off the bed. Um, and then again, I know this is gross, but we've all gone through this. You can go into the bathtub and just rinse it out because you're going to need it again in 20 minutes when he wakes up and and throws up again. So aluminum chafing dish as throw up receptacle is my recommendation this week. I don't know about you, but like growing up, our throw up bowl was like from the kitchen. Which oh, that's was always classy. concerning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it was the big popcorn bowl too. Oh, <laughs> that, it was like designated. Uh, like I so think funny. it was just we didn't use it that much. Yeah, <laughs> but it was like 
And for some reason, that's always stuck with me is like whatever that's... we used to throw up in is not going to be something. <laughs> that, yes. These uh, you can buy at the dollar store for a dollar and then th- you throw it away at the end of the night. Throw it away or used for garbage or something, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. I love this idea, though. It's like such a perfect. Uh, you're right. It's kind of like flexible and disposable, but can be mm-hmm. clean. Could be, be reused for the, the duration for of hours, the yeah. incident. Yeah. It's puke test. That's great. All right, Jamila, let's hear you follow that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's a tough one. So I'm recommending a book that I wonder if I like it's entirely possible that I recommended it last year. It just turned one and it's such an important book to me, something I've mm. relied on in a bit while I'm writing my book. It's called America Goddamn, uh, Violence, Black Women and the Struggle for Justice. It's by Treva Lindsay who's this phenomenal scholar whose uh, work focuses on the lives of Black women. And it's really just a comprehensive look at the lives of Black women in the United States, really our history of experiencing violence intracommunally, you know, at the hands of the police, at the hands of the state. Um, It's just a reckoning with the challenges that Black women face, uh, medical racism, school push out. And it's just really comprehensive and helpful. And I just, uh, it's something that I wish all Americans would read. It's just like, there are probably things in here that some of you all have wondered about or thought about, but wouldn't know for certain because most of us don't spend our time, you know, seriously considering these issues. But um, I just think it's a really helpful, really useful book. That's a great recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, great. Have you have you met her before? I have. Yeah, we've done panels. Like we're cool. You know, we've done panels uh-huh. together. We've got mutual friends. So you know, been an admirer of hers for many years. So excited to see what she does next in terms of books. This is a scholarly work, but it's an accessible scholarly work. I'd really love to see mm-hmm. her write a mass book because she's just got such an important voice. Yeah, Jamila, were you just on a show or something too? Oh, yes. I was on the Rap Caviar documentary series on Hulu. Oh, yeah, I thought, about, I what thought were you talking I about? Seen... I talked about Jack Harlow and I talked about the City Girls. I was in those two episodes. You're a talking That's head. Really cool. Once in a while. That's really cool. <laughs> cool. So we recommend that too. So, so we can find that on Hulu. Yes, it's streaming on Hulu. Great. I'm making her <laughs> like, no, wait, go back. <laughs> no, you must talk promote about yourself, Jamila. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am recommending Brains On is one of my favorite like kids podcasts. And they just had an episode called How We Learned to Read and Why It's Hard with Emily Hanford, who, of course, we had on the show to talk about her podcast, Sold a Story. Mm-hmm. This is an amazing episode for kids. Whether you are interested in this topic or not, Brains On always like produces a really funny, fun episode that my kids all enjoy. But this episode in particular is excellent, so go give that a listen. Again, the it's Brains On, and the episode is How We Learn to Read and Why It's Hard. Great. Right on. This episode is brought to you by Dave. When you need money in a pinch, Dave can help. It's a banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly. No interest, late fees, or credit check. Join the millions already using Dave to get financial relief and sign up for an extra cash account to get up to $500 instantly. Go to dave.com slash Spotify or download the Dave app now. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Priceline presents... Go to your happy price. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. You can see yourself already there. It's beautiful. It might be sunny and sandy for some, neon and urban for others, deserts or rainforests or hiking trails. With Priceline, you can get to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else. Like up to 60% off select hotels to Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to Priceline.com and travel to your happy place for a happy price. All right, see ya. I'm off to Miami. No, actually, wow, look at that. No, I'm going to Hawaii now. Ooh, Cancun looks nice. You know what? Belize looks pretty nice this time of year. Or, mmm, Palm Springs. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. 
All right. Well, it's finally time to open up our mailbag. And first, we have a message that was called into our mom and dad are fighting hotline. And again, you can give that a call at 646-357-9318. Let's take a listen. Hi, mom and dad are fighting. This is Aubrey. I'm just calling in response to the camera sleep plus segment. I actually just recently bought a Polaroid camera for my son just to let him take photos. And it was an intention to bring it on vacation, which has been postponed. But it's just been so fun to see what pictures he takes and what he captures of his little sister and of his life around. Um, so fully support putting the camera in the kids' hands and really enjoyed that segment. Thank you. Bye. Love it. And Polaroids are so fun. That instant satisfaction. Uh, expensive. Film isn't cheap, but it's such a treat. I love, I love getting my hands on a Polaroid. And I guarantee um, your kids would too. Great recommendation. I was just looking to see if I could find like a digital camera for the kids to take so they didn't have to use my phone. Um, so, you know, anyone out there that has a recommendation, like I'm thinking like they yeah. must still sell. I have not. I clearly have not done my research on this. They must still sell the kind we carried around oh, for prior sure. to. They're probably 20 bucks, <laughs> too. I, I would hope or at least yeah. I mean, I just think if the kids could have a real one mm-hmm. to take some digital photos, that might be really fun um, on some of our travels because um, they do like to take their own stuff. But. Yep, I just found there's one on Amazon, portable HD digital kids camera, $22. Yeah, per- okay. I'll be getting some of those. That sounds yeah. perfect. All right, well, here's our next letter. Hi, all. Love the show. Listen to an episode about the six-year-old who told their aunt they had a big belly. I appreciate the direction you were headed with all your responses. Bellies are useful. Bodies are cool, etc. And I wanted to push back a bit on some of the other responses. I'm not an expert by any stretch. I think there are smart people doing great work in this area. I'm loving Virginia Soul Smith's podcast lately, but I think we should start moving kiddos in the direction of body neutrality. I wasn't, it wasn't wrong to say something wherein you insinuate someone is fat. It was wrong because we really should be thinking about commenting on people's bodies as a consent issue. And also fat isn't bad. Fat is just fat. Yes, I recognize we all have our own body image stuff for better or worse, myself included. Commenting on someone's beauty or eyes or weight or whatever can be super problematic and is often sexist and racist and all the things, usually unintentionally. Obviously, you're not going to get kiddos to stop noticing and recognizing the physicality of others, but I think we should not attach so much judgment to it, i.e. it's okay to comment on the aspect of someone's body, but not on this one, and we should talk more about consent and making sure someone wants us to comment on their bodies. I teach elementary school, and I work on this a lot with my kiddos, my students, and my own. All bodies are good bodies. Yep, bodies are different. That's cool. That's all. Thanks for your thoughtful work. I think this is great advice, like uh, that... I actually love the framing of it as consent. Like when Mm -hmm. someone asks us to comment on their bodies, it's okay. Or like if you have a particular relationship, but otherwise kind of avoiding that because it's a body issue and we consent about our bodies, I think is, is a nice way to start thinking about it. Cause I agree. I think when kids um, normally when we comment on someone's like, Oh wow, you look great. I do feel like that is usually in a relationship in which that consent piece exists, mm-hmm. right? Or, or um, is something that we, we have the relationship to understand that's right. a positive thing. Uh, and maybe kids can understand this idea of consenting a little bit better. I like that this letter writer complicates the advice for us. Me too. I've never heard body neutrality. Um, I, I like that as a concept. That's really interesting. I think we have a hard time with these, right? Because we carry so much baggage for it. Mm-hmm. That it's hard to totally. like, uncomplicate it with our own <laughs> baggage for kids. Yes. Yes. All bodies are good bodies. It's your body here. So all bodies are good bodies. Mm-hmm. We actually got a second one from that same episode. Dear hosts, I'm writing with a book recommendation based on the body shaming episode. I highly recommend Bodies Are Cool by Tyler Fedder. The book highlights various skin tones, body shapes, hair types, eyes, glasses, and so on. It even discusses bodies with scars, which could be great for talking about surgeries like double mastectomies that might completely change the appearance of someone in the kiddo's life. Most importantly, the book celebrates all different types of bodies that are all good bodies and has created so many opportunities for discussing different races, gender expression, and body size. Might be a helpful tool in shaping the conversation for the letter writer, as well as many parents and other family members. Thanks. This looks like an awesome book. I'm looking at it right now. It's a super cool book. I've seen it before. I'm going to get this. 
Yeah, I think the more, I mean, this goes back to, to to making sure in your home library and the books that you're getting that all of the, especially if your kids are in picture book ages, that like the people all look different. And I actually, mm-hmm. the scar thing to me is is so important. We, um, through some of the pans and panda stuff we do, are friends with a bunch of families that have had kids that have had medical issues. And some of them do have scars in very noticeable places. Um, I think that can also go to like, there's all kind of skin pigmentation issues and uh, birthmarks, things like that, that kids are often really curious about. Uh, And so just making sure that they're represented too in your home library. Yeah. All right. Well, that does it for today. This episode of Mom and Daughter Fighting is produced by Rosemary Belson and Maura Curry. Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Slate Audio. For Zach Rosen and Jamila Lemieux, I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. It's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No. Yeah.